My name is Steve Lush and I am the council president and in the words of Saturday Night Live, I'm Chevy Chase and you're not. <laughs> I want to talk about our gospel lesson today. Why did Jesus invite Peter to get out of the boat? And why did Peter get out of a perfectly good boat? I'm a software engineer. I've never taken a theology class. I'm not a preacher. I'm really not that nice of a person. <laughs> I'm antisocial. And I have a fear of public speaking. <laughs> so is that what this message is about? That we're just simply supposed to get out of our comfort zone? Well, that's a pretty good answer, but I think there's a better answer, a more complete answer. So software engineers, when they're asked a question, they have a standard response. RTFM, the Christian version of that acronym is, read the fine manual. <laughs> so rather than going to Google or YouTube to find out why Peter got out of a boat, I decided to go ahead and turn to the fine manual, and I just stuck to Matthew's gospel. In Matthew 3, John comes preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then Jesus is baptized and tempted. And in Matthew 4, and verse 17, says, From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. More than 30 times, that phrase is repeated in the New Testament. So what does it mean? It's filled with a bunch of words that, honestly, kind of scare me. That... For me, God's kingdom was some place that I was going to go later after I was done here. But according to the Greeks, there were three heavens. The first heaven is the heaven that we live in right now, the heaven of the air around us. The second heaven is of the stars and the moon. And the third heaven is where God currently resides. But... We all know that God is not just the king of the third heaven. He's the king of all the heavens. So, what does that say? That says, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of God is here in this heaven. The phrase also says repent. That's one of those scary Bible words that... I always used to try to avoid. And I've heard it said that repent means to turn around. But I think a better definition is rather to turn to God. So here we have this saying that John preached and Jesus preached. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In today's English, turn to God. For God's kingdom is here amongst us, available to us. In Matthew 5, Jesus begins what is commonly known as the Sermon on the Mount. I don't think it's a sermon. It's teaching. It's the teaching on the hill, in my mind. And he begins, and he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, or gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Blessed is another one of those Bible words that you have to figure out what it means. Because it doesn't get used much in today's day and age. Some people say it means happy. Now, that one really doesn't fit with, with the way this teaching is going. Happy are the poor in spirit, happy are the mourning, maybe. I found a better definition, I did use Google. <laughs> Blessed. One, a public declaration of favored status with God. And two, being blessed by God endows power for prosperity and success. He gets done telling them the Beatitudes, the blessings, and Jesus immediately says, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt becomes tasteless, how can it be made salty again? 
is no longer good for anything. To be thrown out and trampled underfoot. So the blessed are the seasoning for everyone else. Then he continues, You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. The blessed are to be an example to everyone. And then he concludes Matthew 5 with a series of teachings that say, You have heard, don't commit murder. But I say, don't even say angry words to each other. And he, there's a number of teachings that throughout the remainder of chapter 5 that say, You've heard it said this way, but I say there's a higher standard. So these people who are there listening to Jesus for the first time, teach. They are told they're blessed. They're told they're salt. And they're seasoning for everyone else. They're told that they are to live to a higher standard. Matthew 6 and 7 continue with the teaching on the hill. He teaches them, don't be a hypocrite. Pray to God this way. Stop worrying. Because you're more valuable to God than a bunch of flowers or birds. Stop judging everyone else. Take a look at yourself if you can. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. And Jesus even sums up the entire Old Testament in one sentence. In verse 12. In everything, therefore... Treat people as the same way as you want them to treat you. For this is the law and the prophets. And finally he concludes his teaching with, Therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on a rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the wind blew and slammed against the house. And yet it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the wind blew, and slammed against the house. And it fell, and great was it, its fall. Jesus teaches us in three short chapters of Matthew how to live. If you haven't read Matthew 5-7 through in a while, I'd encourage you to do so. It's filled with wonderful advice for how to live in God's kingdom. Then in chapter 8, it says, As soon as Jesus came down from the hill, a leper came and bowed down before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand to him and touched him and said, I am willing. Be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. This first miracle after the teaching on the hill, I think, says it all. Jesus is willing to touch the untouchable, to clean the uncleanable. Matthew 8 continues with many more miracles. And in Matthew 9, it concludes, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them, because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. And in Matthew 10, he sends his disciples. And he tells them, as you go, preach. Saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you receive, freely give. Further ahead in Matthew 12, 
Jesus is questioned by Pharisees, and they even say that he is the devil, and he heals because he is the devil. And from that point on, Jesus only teaches in parables. And in Matthew 13, he teaches, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in the field. And this smaller than all the other seeds, but when it is fully grown, it is larger than garden plants. It becomes a tree, so that birds of the air can come and nest in its branches. The tiniest seed in God's kingdom grows into a tree. He spoke another parable to him, to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leaven. The tiniest portion of God's kingdom changes everything and everyone it touches. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure in a field, which a man found and hid again. And from the joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. And the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls, and upon finding one of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. The kingdom of heaven is here, it's amongst us, and it is of great value. And my favorite part of chapter 13, when he gets done teaching these parables, he says to them, Have you understood these things? And they said to him, Yes. <laughs> they must be smarter than the rest of us, I guess. We get to Matthew 14, and John is killed. This is Jesus' cousin. Their mothers were great friends. So Jesus gets the news that his cousin's been beheaded. And he heads across the lake because he just needs a little time to himself. Quiet time. And when he gets to the other side, there's 5,000 men with their families waiting for him. And his disciples come to him and they say, send them away so they can go get some food. And Jesus says to his disciples, you feed them. You give them something to eat. And after the loaf and fishes miracle, the disciples pick up all the broken pieces and there are 12 full baskets. Immediately he made them get into a boat and go to the other side. Jesus still needs a little quiet time. So he told his disciples, get in the boat, I'll meet you on the other side. And Jesus sends the crowds away. And I've had some dinner parties, and I've been to some dinner parties. And you got 10 or 15 people. It could take a couple of hours just to get them to leave. <laughs> Can you imagine 5,000 families and they're all there to see him? But he's not going to hurry that process. He's going to send each one away specially and gently. And finally, he gets to go up onto a hill for a little quiet time to pray. Now remember, the disciples, they left early. In the evening, early in the evening. And Jesus comes to them in the fourth watch. The fourth watch is between three and six in the morning. So the disciples have been in a boat for six to nine hours going what's across a four mile lake, battered by waves, in the dark, wet, cold, afraid. I like to fish. I love going fishing. And I'm telling you, when you get into some four and five foot rollers, it's scary. I can only imagine what it's like without a 150 Yamaha motor. <laughs> so Jesus comes to them, and they're afraid. And Peter says, if it's you, Lord, tell me, and I will come out and walk on the water. 
See, Peter, he's one of my favorite disciples because he's constantly messing up, you know, and even though he's also the first to recognize things. He was the first to call Jesus the Son of God. And here he's the first one that actually gets what Jesus is trying to teach them the whole time. What he tried to teach them about the 5,000. We are capable of so much more than we think. So he tells Peter, come, get out of the boat. The kingdom of God is available to us and amongst us. And we are to live in it and use it. And just like those first folks that listened to Jesus teaching on the hill, we're also blessed. And we are endowed with power for success. We're to be an example to others. Seasoning them for life in God's kingdom. We're to live to a higher standard. To live by the golden rule. To live as disciples. We're capable of so much more than we think possible when we live as disciples in the kingdom of God. Lord, if you tell me to walk on water, I will. And if I start to sink, I know you'll be there to save me. The boat isn't merely a comfort zone. Getting out of the boat is an invitation to live an amazing life. Accomplishing unbelievable things. As you go, preach, say, the kingdom of, God, of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, feed 5,000, walk on water, get out of the boat. Amen.